more to Grace Bible Church. We are thankful that you're joining us via Facebook this morning. If you have the desire to give, the link is there, and you can avail yourself of that. I want to begin this morning by reading a passage from Revelation chapter 21. Uh, this is the Apostle John. He's exiled on the island of Patmos, and God gives him a vision of heaven. And here's what he says in Revelation 21, starting at verse 22. The Apostle John says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. He said the temple in heaven is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's stand and sing, I will trust my Savior Jesus. <clears throat>
come and read a piece of scripture and pray for us. You can be seated for a moment. Today is in Matthew 3, 1 through 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and will sit as a refiner. Uh, he will purify the sons of Levi, and will refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you, Lord, for your righteousness. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that it's not up to us, and it's not all about our good behavior and works, but it's about this unimaginable price that you paid for our salvation. God, we just thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty, and we thank you that you're sovereign over our future, and all that's going on now. And God, we just don't understand, but God, we just thank you, Lord, for making a way for us. Lord, just help us, Lord, to go forth and make the gospel clear and make the gospel just as plain as it can be because it is so plain and it is so simple. And Lord, we just couldn't pay this price for our salvation, but you've made a way and you paid the price. And God, just help us to acknowledge that and all that we do today. And all that we do, Lord, just help us to bring honor to you today and just help Brent as he stands before us. And God, just use him for your glory. And God, we thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand again and sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
hope in life and death.
Father, we come to you this morning through Jesus Christ because he is the one mediator between God and man. He is the point of access to you, Father, and no man comes to the Father except through him. And so we pray, Lord, that as we look at John chapter 2, that Jesus would be high and lifted up, that he would be seen in all his beauty, in all his glory, uh, in all his splendor and majesty, and that our hearts would rejoice in him, that our hearts would hope in him, and that all of our life and comfort and peace and joy and expectation would be found in Jesus Christ. We pray that he would be central, and that as we behold his glory, you would trans transform us from one degree of glory to the next, Lord. Uh, we ask, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would open up the word to us now. Help me to preach in a way that honors Christ. Help me to preach with humility. Help me to preach in the fear of the Lord, and help me to know you, Father, as I preach. I pray, Lord, for those watching who are unconverted, I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would save them through the preaching of the gospel. I pray for those who are watching who are already Christians, that you would uh, just seal them and edify them and strengthen them in the faith. Lord, strengthen me in the faith. I pray, Father, that you be glorified in this church. pray that you would give us everything that we need to do your will. Pray, Father, that you would make Grace Bible Church a sending church, that you would bring people here who want to go to the nations with the gospel of grace, that you would bring people here who want to send them, uh, that you would enable us to plant churches and train pastors and offer biblical counseling, and that we would be uh, a church who is active in foster care and adoption, and above all, that we would be a church that is active in spreading the gospel, Lord, in Swain County and Jackson County and ultimately to the nations. Uh, Lord, I just ask that you would be pleased uh, with the words of my mouth now, that you would be pleased with our hearing of the word. Pray, Father, that you would block out distractions, uh, that you would block out any hindrances uh, to the hearing of the word of God, and that we'd be able to just rivet our attention on Jesus here for a few minutes, and that we would be uh, made like him even now by the Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you found your place in John chapter 2, we'll pick up in verse 13 and read through. Verse 22, John 2, 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it, it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So where is the best place to encounter God? Uh, all the major world religions have a different answer to this question. Where, where do you come to meet with God, to encounter God, to connect with God? So if you go to a Hindu country, uh, you will notice that on pretty much every high mountain, there will be a, a piece of rope strung up, and it'll be tied to two rocks. There'll be these colored pieces of cloth flapping in the wind on it. These are uh, prayer cloths. and uh, These high places are where you encounter God, and so you tie your prayer cloth up, and when the wind blows, your prayers go up to God. You know, the high places are where you encounter God in the Hindu faith. Uh, Muslims believe uh, that God can be encountered or met with in a special way at Mecca. So, so Muslims always pray facing Mecca, and their most important mosque is there in Mecca. And in the center of this mosque in Mecca, you probably see it on TV, is this huge black cube. Have you, have you seen that? And, and they make pilgrimages, to, and they all get around this big black cube because this is the house of Allah. This is where you can connect with Allah in a special way in the Muslim faith. Uh, if you're a Buddhist, uh, you make a pilgrimage to the Mahabodhi Temple, 
in Bihar, India. And the reason is because the Bodhi tree is located there. And at the Bodhi tree, that's where Buddha received enlightenment. And so uh, you go to this temple as a special place to meet God. It is a sacred site, so to speak. But where can people truly encounter the one true God? In John chapter 2, we find Jesus at a holy place at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus is attending the first of uh, three and maybe even four Passover feasts that are mentioned in John's Gospel. And you know, most people are, are very surprised to find out uh, uh, when they read John's Gospel and start paying attention to what's going on, that Jesus actually cleansed the temple two different times. He did it once at the beginning of his ministry, and that's the account we get here in John's Gospel. But when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get an account of him doing it again. And the scripture we just read is the first occasion that he did at the beginning of his ministry. Look with me again at verse 13 and verse 14. Verse, verse 13 says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. So, the Passover celebration was a huge festival, okay? It was a big deal. And people would come from all over the Roman world to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Uh, some of them would come from all the way across the Mediterranean because this was a major uh, social and religious event. And so when you went to the Passover festival, there was two things you need to get done, right? The first thing was this. You need to offer a sacrifice. And if you're coming from 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 miles away, it's kind of hard to bring a sheep with you. <laughs> and so a nice little industry had sprung up there in the temple courts, in the court of the Gentiles, to provide sacrificial animals for uh, pilgrims coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festival. The second thing you needed to do was you needed to pay the temple tax. And the only kind of coin that could be used to pay the temple tax was something called a Tyrian shekel. And so you had to take your denarii or whatever other kind of currency you had and you had to exchange it for a Tyrian shekel so you could pay the temple tax. And so a nice little industry had cropped up there in the court of the Gentiles to change money at a profit, of course. And so this is what we find Jesus looking at here in John chapter 2. When he arrives, uh, this holy place where people have come to encounter God. Jesus does not hear the sound of uh, reverent worship or heartfelt prayer. Jesus hears coins jingling and oxen lowing and sheep bleeding. He hears the sound of busy commerce there. This temple, this place that was meant to provide access to God, has become a marketplace that is blocking access to God and obscuring the true worship of God and keeping people from encountering and knowing God. And as Jesus takes all this in, he begins to burn with a holy anger. And so where can people truly encounter God? The first answer to that question is this, not through man-made religion. Look at verse 15 and 16. In his anger, verse 15 says that Jesus makes a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So, yes, there actually is such a thing as holy anger. In fact, if certain things uh, do not make you angry, do not disturb you, do not raise your ire, that's not a sign of godliness. It's a sign of wickedness and apathy. And so Jesus saw some things going on that were wrong, and he became angry. Uh, if man-made religion that obscures the gospel and blocks access to God does not make you live it, then there's a good chance you may not be a Christian. Uh, Josh Moody, a Bible commentator, says this, Jesus reserves his sharpest opposition for Pharisees, not for prostitutes. 
and for temple religion gone wrong rather than for people who get drunk at the local pub. Jesus hates fake religion, and the reason for that is because it blocks access to God. What's so bad about fake religion? Well, it doesn't glorify and honor God, but when God is not glorified and honored, people can't see him for who he is, and people can't come to him and be saved. That's the horror of false religion. The prophet Malachi had predicted that the Messiah would be a person who comes and restores right worship and cleanses the temple. That's the scripture that Lee read earlier. Malachi 3, 1 through 3. Let me read it again. Uh, Prophet Malachi said, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. What does a refiner's fire do? It purifies. What does a fuller's soap do? It cleanses. Malachi 3.3, 3, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. So Jesus came to the temple here at Passover, at the beginning of his ministry, for, to fulfill uh, Malachi's prophecy, to cleanse the temple, to purify the temple. And many of the Jews who saw what Jesus was doing would have seen a direct connection between his actions and the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy. I've got a question for you this morning. Uh, as we get into the Gospel of John, I wonder if you've noticed something that I've noticed. Uh, have you noticed how little the Jesus of Scripture resembles the Jesus that is portrayed to us by mainstream American evangelicalism? Have you noticed that so far? So, uh, the Jesus of Scripture, how does he start his ministry? He goes to a wedding feast, he makes 768 bottles of wine, and then he goes up to the temple, and he drives people out of the temple with a whip, and basically starts this stampede, Okay? That's the Jesus of Scripture. And he does this with a zeal that would put the holiest person you could imagine to shame. Is that the Jesus that gets preached from American pulpits? Let me ask another question. Why is it that in most American churches, you know, if, if we weren't having coronavirus time and we were having normal meetings, you could go in most American churches and roughly two-thirds of the people sitting there would be female. One third would be male. So the people that garner the statistics on these kind of things say that in the average church in America, 61% of people sitting there on Sunday morning are female, 39% of male are male. Why is that the case? Because the American church has portrayed Jesus Christ as this person with long flowing hair that reaches down to his waist. Typically, he's, uh, he's sitting there in, in photographs or drawings of him uh, wearing something that looks like a nightgown. And he's the kind of person, uh, as you see him portrayed like this, you would imagine his favorite hobby was petting cats or crochet. This is not the Jesus of Scripture. This is not the Jesus that we're seeing in John's Gospel. The American church has not portrayed Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who comes to the temple in Jerusalem and single-handedly acts as the bouncer there during the biggest religious festival of the year. Uh, you see, Jesus is a man's man. The Jesus of Scripture. Not the Jesus of American evangelicalism. The Jesus of Scripture is a man's man. He is not a spineless, effeminate sissy. Jesus came to do battle with a snake for the souls of men at the cost of his own blood. He did not come to practice proper etiquette, to promote unity with false churches, to plant flowers or pick up trash with a service club. And maybe if our churches held forth the Jesus of Scripture to people, then we might see the male-female ratio in our churches come to something like 50-50, right? Because Jesus Christ is not Mr. Rogers. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. We, we see that in him here in John chapter 2. Look at verse 15 again. Verse 15 says, And making a whip of cords, he drove them 
all out. So Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher that the world has ever seen, made a whip of cords and flogged people out of the temple. You know, it's a tragic fact that a man can serve as a pastor in most American churches for 40 or 50 years, even if he doesn't preach the true gospel and doesn't have any zeal for the glory of God and the true worship of God. All that you have to do in most churches is this. If you want to maintain your tenure, you need to be cordial, you need to have good manners, you need to be nice, and you need to act proper, and you need to make really sure that you don't ever ruffle anybody's feathers. And you will have a nice long tenure in most American churches. Also, you have to make sure that you don't preach sermons that talk about sin, death, hell, the holiness of God, the coming judgment, or blood atonement. And you will be someone who's praised as a pastor in most American churches. You know, I have a friend uh, that I went to seminary with, and he took a church in Texas a few years back. And he was there for about a year and a half, and things were going really well. And then he uh, found out that one of his deacons was doing something that wasn't right, and it was hurting the church, and it was keeping people from Christ. And so he went and talked to this deacon about it. And the deacon was very dismissive and said, you know, what, what I'm doing is not wrong, and I'm going to keep doing it. And, you know, you just need to back down. And so my pastor friend went to another deacon and said, look, we've got a situation over here. We've got to, we've got to address this. And the other deacon was like, well, I don't know. That's really going to stir things up and muddy the water. Well, a couple months went by, and they had a business meeting at the church. And lo and behold, my, uh, my friend who was the pastor was voted out as the pastor <laughs> because he had a zeal that God would be worshipped in the right way because he wanted to see people come to Christ. And that zeal, no, sir, we've got to get rid of this guy. Well, here in John 2, somebody failed to warn Jesus before he started cracking a whip on the backside of hypocrites and turning over tables and stampeding oxen and exposing sin, that such behavior was out of line with proper etiquette and that it would offend people. And didn't Jesus know that, that when he offended people that uh, attendance would go down at the temple and that when attendance went down that the offering would go down? And so Somebody didn't tell Jesus all this stuff. And so he started to stampede there. Uh, look with me at verse 17, please. Verse 17 says that his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus' disciples remembered that the Old Testament had forecast that the Messiah would be someone who would have an all-consuming zeal for the right worship of God. An all-consuming zeal that people would be able to see God in his temple and be able to know him through that right worship. King David uh, in the Old Testament was passionate about God's house and about God's people. And in Psalm 69, King David uh, is being persecuted on account of his commitment to God's house and to right worship. And he cries out in Psalm 69, 9, he says these words. He says, uh, Lord, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach. Zeal for your house has consumed me. And now Jesus Christ, the true and greater David, comes with a truer and greater zeal to fulfill the words of Psalm 69 and single-handedly cleanses the temple here at this Passover feast. In verse 17 of John chapter 2, the apostle John changes David's words a little bit as he quotes them from Psalm 69.9. So if you go back and read Psalm 69.9, it says... Uh, David, King David is saying, zeal for your house has consumed me. And if you look at the quotation there in John 2, it says, zeal for your house will, future tense, consume me. And John changes the verb tense because he's trying to foreshadow something. He's trying to say, Jesus is so zealous for the right worship of God so that people can have access to God that in his zeal, he will literally allow himself to be consumed by the wrath of God so that people like you and me can have access to the Father through him. Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus hates man-made religion because it blocks access to God. Zeal for the right and true worship of God is one of the defining marks of a man or woman who knows the one true God. 
The temple was packed with people here in John 2 who did not care about true worship. They didn't care if people were able to come to the Passover feast and encounter God in his temple. And Jesus could not bear to see the false religion that kept people from knowing God, so he drove these merchants out with a whip. True men and women of God have a burning zeal to do the same. Not with a whip, but by exposing false gospels and man-centered worship for what it is. It is soul-damning heresy that robs God of his glory, that obscures the gospel, and ultimately sinks the souls of men and women into hell. Here in John 2, Jesus enters his father's house and he has this keen awareness of the holiness of God. Now, we in the American church tend to rationalize all kinds of worldly methods and worldly activities because we've forgotten what it means to worship God, just as these people in John chapter 2 had forgotten what it means to worship God. It wasn't about busyness and hubbub and man-centered activity. It was about focusing on who God is. You know, I was once a member of a church that tried to do so many different things on Sunday morning that it felt more like a circus than worship. It was just so busy. There were so many things. You know, we got 12, 13 different things we're doing during the worship service. So jam-packed with activity. There was so much going on that it was hard to see the gospel. But the next church that we were able to be members of had the simplest services you could imagine. Uh, they didn't even have Sunday school. All you did was you came to church. You, know, you went into a prayer room. You prayed. Then you went into the service. And somebody led in a God-honoring prayer. And then there were songs that honored God. And then the guy preached a Christ-honoring sermon. And you went home. There was none of this hubbub and circus and busyness and chatter and... I always left edified and refreshed and strengthened in the Lord because I had access to God through right worship and my soul was fed. Uh, I, I attend from time to time a pastor's fellowship in Mills River, North Carolina. I haven't been able to do it lately, of course, but uh, earlier in the year I was able to attend one. And uh, the man who leads it is, is about 55 years old, uh, somewhere between 55 and 60, I would guess. And almost all the other guys who uh, attend this pastor's fellowship are substantially younger than I am. Some of them are in their late 20s, some of them in their early 30s. And uh, that fellow who leads it, who's 55 or 60 years old, he, he said to us one morning while we were sitting around the table, he says, I know you guys are young. And he said, I know you have a lot of zeal for the Lord. You know, I'm waiting for the other foot to drop. He, he's going to tell us something like you need to temper that zeal or you need to watch out for that zeal. He said, I know, I know a lot of you guys are young. You have a lot of zeal for the Lord. And he said, don't you ever lose it. <laughs> and I was so thankful for what he said because zeal for the glory of God and the right worship of God so that people can have access to God is the mark of a true man or woman of God. You see, our God, Scripture tells us, is a jealous God. So the word for jealous in both testaments is the same as the word for zealous. Okay, there's one word in Hebrew that means jealous and zealous. And there's one word in Greek that means jealous and zealous. So if you're jealous for God's glory, you're <laughs> zealous for God's glory. And if you're zealous for God's glory, you're jealous for God's glory. And so true servants of God are jealous to see that God is worshiping. Because religion keeps people knowing God. You know, in the book of Numbers, uh, the men of Israel were sent because they were taking, uh, I think it was Moabite women for their wives, and God had told his people there in the Old Testament, he said, do not take foreign women as your wives because they're going to bring their idols in and they're going to bring their false gods in, and you're going to wind up worshiping them. And so there was a guy there in Numbers chapter 25. His name was Phineas. And he saw one of his fellow Jews sleeping with a Midianite woman. And in his zeal, he took a spear and he ran it through that guy's stomach and into the woman that he was sleeping with. He killed both of them with a spear in his zeal, in his jealousy for God's glory. And here's what Numbers 25, 10 through 13 says about Mr. Phineas. <laughs> and the Lord said to Moses, Phineas 
has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. God says, Phineas was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say to Phineas, Behold, I give you, Phineas, my covenant of peace, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Not what we would expect, huh? Uh, in 1 Kings 19, the prophet Elijah said this. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord. We might say zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your people with the sword. So how had Elijah been zealous and jealous for God's glory? Well, he confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, you remember? And he showed that the God of Israel was the one true God. He showed that all the prophets of Baal were phonies who were pushing man-made religion on people and keeping people from having access to the one true God. And so uh, God allowed Elijah to defeat them there. And when the prophets of Baal were shown to be phonies, what did Elijah do? Well, 1 Kings 18 and 40 says, Elijah said to the people, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slapped them on the back. <laughs> but it says, Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and he slaughtered them there. Elijah was a man who was zealous for God's glory. And he slaughtered the false prophets of Baal at the brook Kishon. And now we see in John chapter 2, Jesus, the true servant of the Lord, burning with a holy zeal to see his Father worshipped rightly because he knows that man-made religion keeps people from God. Uh, Jesus was also zealous for love, and he was zealous for saving grace. And now that Jesus has cleansed the temple, what can happen? People can come from all over the Roman Empire, and they can see the symbols of the gospel in the Passover. And they can come to know God. And they can be saved. You know, the merchants had desecrated the temple and Jesus had come to cleanse it. Later, Jesus' body, the true temple, would be desecrated when all of our sin and all of our filth would be laid on him at the cross of Calvary. And Jesus Christ, the true temple of God, would cleanse us not with the blood of an animal sacrifice, but with his own blood. So, where do people encounter God? Not through man-made religion, but through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18 through 21. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So, here in John chapter 2, Jesus creates quite a ruckus. And so the temple authorities show up to see what all this disturbance is about. And they basically come out with the attitude, We're the authorities here. And you're acting like you're an authority because you drove these merchants out of the temple. What sign do you show us that you've got the authority to do this? And Jesus says, well, just go ahead and kill me and see what happens. He says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus doesn't say destroy the temple. He says destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up because he wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. And Jesus is saying that he is replacing the temple as the place where people meet God. Replacing the temple as the point of access to God. Uh, D.A. Carson says this, quote, Jesus has become the living abode of God on earth, the fulfillment of all the temple meant and the center of all true worship. In this temple, the temple of Jesus' body, the ultimate sacrifice would soon take place. Now, in John chapter 1, the Apostle John has already alluded to the fact that Jesus is the true temple of God. Do you remember John 1.14? 
Uh, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word dwelt there is literally the verb tented or tabernacled among us. Uh, John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And Jesus, uh, John is using that language to say that Jesus is the true tabernacle of God, the true temple of God, the place where we meet and worship God. When John says the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, John is saying Jesus is the true temple. And here in John 2, Jesus comes out and says that about himself. I am the true temple. Now in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15 and verse 38, uh, Jesus dies on the cross and he breathes his last. And Mark says that when that happened, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And that was symbolic of the fact that uh, the temple was now obsolete. And that people would no longer come to encounter God and meet God at the Jewish temple, but they would come through the body and blood of Jesus. And the next verse in Mark's gospel says this. Now, this is Mark 15, 39. And when the centurion who stood facing Jesus, hang, who was hanging there on the cross and had just died, when the centurion saw that in this way he breathed his last, the centurion said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And so in John chapter 2, we see all these merchants and money changers. They're set up in the court of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles can't come and see and know the one true God because of all the hubbub and the bustle. And we see in Mark's gospel that Jesus dies. And the veil of the temple is torn in two. And he becomes the place where people meet and encounter God. And one of the first people to come to God through Christ is a Gentile centurion. The very kind of person who was kept from knowing God through the symbols of the Passover feast in John 2 by all the hustle and bustle that Jesus was criticizing and attacking. We'll see in a couple of weeks as we get to John chapter 4 that Jesus comes to uh, a well in Samaria and he meets a Samaritan woman there. And she wants to get into a discussion with him about where the right place to worship is. And in John chapter 4 verse 20 she says this, uh, speaking to Jesus, she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Uh, this mountain would be Mount Gerizim in, in Samaria. She says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So she says, We're supposed to worship at Mount Gerizim. Pretty soon, when none of those places will matter anymore, because I will die, I will shed my blood for sinners, I will rise, and I will become the true temple, and all men will come to the Father through me, not through a temple in Samaria or through a temple in Jerusalem. You know, a couple years ago, uh, my wife and I had a wedding anniversary, and uh, we, we had an idea that we would go up on the parkway and look at the stars never done that before so I thought if we go up high and get away from all natural light then we'll be able to see the stars better so we went up on black balsam it's like 6,000 something feet we're going to look at the stars well we didn't see any stars because the fog was super thick <laughs> so we just sat there in the fog and I think we ate some chocolate pie or something we just sat on a rock up there and uh, the amazing thing I didn't know this is that there's people walking around in the dark up there just scans of them at midnight on top of this mountain. I, I didn't know that, but uh, I guess that's one of the side effects of living close to Asheville. But uh, there's some woman that walked by us there in the dark. It was like 11.30 at night, and a man starts talking to this woman and starts to have a conversation with her. I said, uh, do, you, do you go to church anywhere, you know? And she said, uh, no, I don't go to church anywhere. She said, this is my church. In other words, uh, nature is where I... I meet with, connect with, and encounter God. Nature is my temple, is what she was saying. And a lot of people believe that. Uh, not, not just Hindus, but a lot of people in America. But Jesus says that that won't work because he is the only person through whom we can come to God and know God. We might be able to understand that there is a God through nature, but we can't actually encounter him and meet him and know him except through Christ because the creation and the creator are two different things. In Catholicism, uh, Catholics teach that uh, the most sacred shrine, 
the holiest place is the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And this is evidently some kind of church that was built over uh, a supposed place where Jesus was buried. And so that is a really holy site in Catholicism. Uh, the Catholics also teach that wherever the saints, and especially uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary, have walked on earth, that that is holy ground. And then uh, Catholics have um, relics. You know, you got you got boxes that supposedly this is uh, Peter's forearm bone in this box. And if you will touch this box or go to this shrine or do this thing, you can get some holy mojo, for lack of a better word, to, to put it. That's what Catholics teach. Uh, friends, the only place where you can be made holy is through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. No temple, no building, no site, no holy relic can do that. Jesus is God's holy place. Jesus said, you tear down this temple, I'll raise it up again in three days. Secular people think they can meet God through human reason or by listening to their inner voice. The only place where you can encounter God is through Christ. He is the place where heaven and earth meet. He's the new temple. In him all the fullness of deity dwell. In Acts chapter 6, uh, Stephen, witnessing for Christ, tells these Jewish authorities who are so obsessed with the temple. They're all about the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple. And how they're made right with God through this temple worship. And Stephen says, you're going to have to be made right with God through Christ, not through the temple. Are you someone who thinks that you'll make it to heaven because you've been faithful to attend church, to support its ministries, or to tithe? If so, you're like these people that Stephen was talking to in Acts chapter 6 who were about the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple. Have you given allegiance to Jesus Christ or to a religious institution or a religious system? Uh, religious institutions and systems can't save us. Only Christ can save us. Church can't save us. Only Christ can save us. Jesus Christ is the true temple. He's the focal point of all true worship, and he's the only place where sinful men and sinful women can get access to a holy God. Look at verse 22 again. Verse 22 says, When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Have you believed the scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken? Have you come to the Father through Jesus Christ this morning? You see, the temple was the place where God and man met. The temple was the place where God accepted believers on account of a bloody sacrifice. And here in John 2, Jesus is saying, I'm going to replace the temple as the location where people come to God and meet God through the sacrifice of my own blood and body. He said, I'm going to replace the temple. Have you come to Jesus? Have you come to the Father through the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus? Do you have fellowship with God today through Jesus Christ, his Son? Not through man-made religion, but through the body and blood of the true temple, Jesus Christ. Jesus says this later on in John's Gospel. He said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Did you know that if you have never that day, you do that. That's the wonderful thing about what Jesus is saying by telling us that he is the true temple. You can come to God by putting your faith in the body and blood of Jesus to cleanse you of your sin by coming to Jesus as your king. And you can do that right where you're at. You know, if you're on Facebook today and you're at home watching us, you don't have to like make some kind of pilgrimage to a holy site or go to a church or uh, jump to a bunch of hoops. You just go straight to Jesus right now and you say, God, have mercy on me, the sinner that I am. Because Jesus is available to everyone. He is where we meet God. Will you do that today? If you've already done that today, will you... Rejoice in the fact that Jesus gives you access to God forever. Will you rejoice in the fact that he has made you right through his once-for-all sacrifice for your sin? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, he is 
the true temple. He's the place where heaven and earth meet. He is the point of access uh, to God. And no man comes to the Father but through him. Not only is he the true temple, he's the true sacrifice that makes sinners clean. And not only is he the true temple and the true sacrifice, but he is the high priest, Lord, who is our eternal mediator between God and man. We pray, Lord, that you would enable people to trust in him today who have never done so. We pray that you would enable those of us who have trusted to believe even more. And we ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing and, or stand rather, and sing Christ our hope in life and death one more time. equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 